Hi, I'm Itu, and this is a devlog for Thunderizon, a rhythm game using procedural generation. These last days I made a lot of progress. I finished the level and now the game experience is practically complete. It's a good time to talk more in depth about game design, finally! Thunderizon's mechanics are very simple. Blocks appear on screen, player must hit them at the right time by using the four directional buttons. But what are the rules around it? How does the player progress and are there fail conditions? These are questions that once again I had to ask by making one kind of a grid. The design foundations that I established there didn't change much, although there has been some evolution. I mostly opted for a minimalist design revolving around survival. Meaning there is no score, not even a fixed duration on the track, the game runs in a loop until the player wins. It's a game design philosophy I've already used in a previous game, Line Momentum. I made a video about it on another channel, but it's in French, so to make it short, I'm not fond of opaque scoring system. Either the player win, either they fail, there's no in-between. So when you hit a note correctly, you fill up a bar that leads you to the next layer. To succeed a layer, you need to hit 30 notes. But if you miss a note, you lose some of your progression and you can even get one layer back down. It's on this part that the game differs slightly from One Call of a Grid. In One Call of a Grid, if you miss a note, you fall directly one layer down. I told you it's a hard game. But there was a mechanic to smooth it, the shield. When the player reached a new layer, they won a shield represented by the squares on the sides that allowed them to take one damage without falling down. It was simple, elegant, but I think no one understood it. Since players frequently missed, they never had more than one shield. And so what they understood is that if they missed twice, they lose the layer. It was stressing and mostly frustrating when they were at the very end. So in Sound Horizons, I had to change this mechanic in order to make it more intuitive and more generous. We need to take into account that the player is likely to miss frequently, but should still be rewarded when they progress in a layer. And I wanted it to remain simple to show on screen. I don't want no numbers or text or any information that require reflection. This is a fast-paced game, so everything must be understood with just a glimpse. And so the solution was eventually something even more minimalist. Now the progress bar is also a health bar. When the player takes damage, they lose a third of the bar total. And when it reaches zero, they go down one layer. It's already more friendly, because it means that if the player gets far enough into the layer, they stay inside it and can catch back. The issue, however, is that if they just got to the layer, at the first mistake they'll go down immediately. It might be very frustrating. It's like when in a roguelite you get to a new level and get killed by the first mob. So to avoid this scenario, I kept the shield ID when you arrive in a new layer. You only have one, which allows you on each layer to make one mistake that doesn't count. For the UI, I've made several iterations and eventually I showed it with these little sparks. I had to avoid something too stressful, like a blinking red, but it had to be visible. I know that some players won't understand it immediately. It might need several tries. I'm looking forward to the playtest results. The strength of this game design is that it keeps a constant flow. Even when the player loses, the game doesn't stop, it just continues without interruption. The difficulty even adapts itself to the player's skills. If a layer is too hard for them, we make them go back to the one before so that they can train and get better until they're good enough. That's what made the small success of One Call of a Grid. The game was hard, but since there was no game over, players kept playing and playing and playing and playing until they reached the end. And since we are mentioning it, it's time I show you the one I've just implemented for Thunder Rising. Like One Call of a Grid, the mood changes, everything goes silent, it's the moment of truth. You can already see some differences from the regular game. First, the bar doesn't progress with successful hits, but in a linear way. It's because this time it's a time challenge. You have to survive for 16 bars. And when I say surviving, I mean that any mistake makes you go back. It's really a final boss. But it's actually not that hard, because as you have noticed, the notes are going slower. On top of adding a little twist for the end, it also allows to present a final test that is intimidating, but in the end not so daunting if the player learns the mechanics well. It's the end of the level, so it's okay to have a bit of a challenge here. The game is pretty short, so let's make it last while we can. Once the boss is defeated, we congratulate the player and reward them with the last layer, where we let them do this. <laughs> The game design thing I like to do is giving rewards that make sense. 
allowing the player to just play with the instruments, I find it fun and satisfying. Sam Horizon's musical system is one of its main strengths, so let's make the best use of it. It's a fitting conclusion to the experience. And so this is how Sam Horizon's full session goes. There are also small mechanics I added to balance it, like the flush of the notes when you miss one. You know in a rhythm game when you make a mistake and so you lose track of the rhythm, you panic and you make even more mistakes? That's something I wanted to avoid. So when the player miss a note, or even when they reach a new layer, we clean everything and we wait a short pause before getting back on track. This way there is no panic, the player makes one single error, but they are not left behind. This is in the continuation of the minimalist vision. The game is challenging, but doesn't fill the player's mind with too much information. Everything is here to encourage them to play music continuously. But for this, it also needs a difficulty that naturally evolves. This is the second point that I've improved. In my first devlog, I explained that rhythm patterns were becoming longer and had more varied notes along the layers, and could also start on beat or off beat. This is globally the algorithm I had until now. But it wasn't really enough to manage difficulty. Because there's quite a lot of parameters that makes a melody harder to repeat than another. When I made one color for grid, I thought that the harder notes would be 8 notes, because they are faster. But actually, it wasn't that at all. What gave the most troubles to player were longer intervals, like dotted quarter notes, and especially everything that was off beat. Like, quarter notes alone are easy. But if you had a eighth note, then the following quarter notes will all land off beat, and so they become hard. Ok, um, this doesn't mean anything musically speaking, so let's switch to a more technical language. The game represents notes by the length of the interval to wait before the next one. A rhythm phrase in Sound Horizons looks like this. It means we play the first note, then we wait one beat interval, in this case a eighth note, before playing the second note, which is a four, so we wait four beats, then we play, and then we wait two beats, then we play the last one, and since it's the last, we don't care about its value. Between each phrase, we wait a constant delay of six beats before starting the next phrase, either on an even beat or an uneven beat, depending on the difficulty. Generating phrases thus means generating number series like this one. And so, to make easy ones or less easy ones, there are two solutions. Either I manually write some phrases, which I do for the tutorial and the ending, which gives me full control on the difficulty. Or if I want emergence and surprising results, then I need to set down mathematic rules. And there are quite a lot. Rule number one. During tutorial, we start on the bar, so on a beat that is multiple of four. Rule two. A long phrase will overlap with the player's input, so we must begin with short phrases before making longer ones later. Rule three. To play on beat, we must start on an even beat, then the sum of the played notes must also be even. Except that rule four. If we play only two or four, the melodies are boring, so we can play one or three as long as the next note fixes the even rule. Rule five. Three is tricky. Or dare I say even dangerous, so to ease it, it must be next to a 1, before or after. But rule 6, the last note is always 0, so the penultimate note cannot be a 3, except if there is a 1 just before. Rule 7, the fourth layer plays on off beats, so the sum of the notes must be uneven, except if rule 8, if we start on an uneven beat, then to stay off beat, the sum must stay even. And rule 9, too many 2 or 4 is too easy, so no more than 3, 2 or 2, 4. And rule 10, too many 1 or 3 is too hard, so the maximum are 4, 1 and 2, 3. But of course, rule 11, rule 3, 5, 7 and 8 takes priority over rules 9 and 10. And, and 1, and, except the 3, and too many, too... But, Anyway, there's an entire logic dedicated to generate different kinds of melody. This allows me to configure scriptable objects with lots of options so that each layer has its own difficulty. And actually, the goal here is not only about difficulty, it's also about aesthetic. In the end, what we are playing is music. And if it's too chaotic or too repetitive, it's not sounding great anymore. We must find a good balance to bring a satisfying difficulty while allowing the player to play nice melodies. Thankfully, the two usually go together. I found a good compromise between a modular solution and specific rule for some layers that makes the exact melodies I need. It required some trial and error, but I eventually obtained satisfying results with a difficulty that increases with each layer. And even inside the layers themselves, some have now a second half that is slightly harder than the first one. 
There's only the ending where the phrases are not random, except for the directions. It was important here to precisely control the experience, with patterns that are not too hard but gets a bit tricky around the end, and most importantly with satisfying melody. However, the last part that needs to be done, and you can clearly see it, is the UI. Those large scrolling rectangles, these kinds of rounded tiles, well, first it's very ugly, but also it's visibly not aligned with rhythm. So this is the last aspect that I have finally fixed. The circle on tunnel was the starting point of the new visual design of Sound Horizons, but now I have to make it pretty. You should understand that this UI is purely for show only. The exact timing are computed from the music data. What's displayed on screen is only a visual transposition. It has no impact on the game. But it's crucial because it's that UI that will help the player understand the timing. So it needs to be precisely aligned with rhythm. The 3D and 2D mix that you see is made with a cylinder on which we project the texture of 2D UI canvas. In fact, every asset and animation are handled in 2D with anchors which makes things way easier, because for example, the block scrolling is just made by moving its Y anchor from 0 to 1. I can then scale everything how I want, and it will still work. This scrolling uses the duration of the interval, so it's perfectly aligned with the moment the player must press the button. However, that's not enough, because there's another thing that your UI must show, the tolerance margin. We can't ask player to hit buttons on the perfect frame, there is a small delay before and after where the input is still valid. And until now, the sprite I used adds fixed height, that I chose arbitrarily. It's a completely imprecise approximation, and we can clearly see that it doesn't work anymore for the end, where the timings are different. So the first thing I did was setting the block size by script. We have a lane with the height h, and the timing is the duration of the 4th 8th note interval, plus the error margin. From there, we can calculate the hit point of the note, and the size of the acceptance zone relatively to this time. I'll spare you the math. I first decided that the height will be a constant, and that I will apply the margin on the block size. We'll see what it does. We can notice here that the error margin is way more generous than what I thought. Ok, so at least we have a properly aligned UI, but visually it's still perfectible. It's ugly alright, but also it's not clear if we must ease the note when the block reaches the limit or when it's on the middle, and it's difficult to read if we are a bit too early or too late. So I went back to thin blocks, and instead I drew a line on the hit point. The tolerance margin is slightly grayed, with a gradient before the line so that player will target it. To make these visuals, I once again used only shaders. Yeah, you might say that writing shaders to draw lines and rectangles with a gradient, it's a bit of an engineered, but here I don't have to worry about the size of my sprites, and look, I can modify them directly in the editor to set the gradient size and strength, aligned with it, it's so convenient! And it also allowed me to make this animation on the line, which makes a great difference, doesn't it? Now we're starting to have a fancy UI. Some iterations later, I realized that it looks even better without the borders. Just a full circle is consistent with the minimalist look, and it puts the environment in front. We have now the practically final visuals. The level has a tutorial and an end, the difficulty is well balanced, and visually it looks like a finished product. I think it's time to start playtest. I need people to play the prototype I have and collect some feedbacks. If you're interested, let me know in the comments or directly on the itch.io page. As for what's next, well, now that we have the game, it needs a package. Menu, Settings, Start Screen, we'll explore UX, but also Aesthetic for Fonts, Logo and Graphic Identity. If you're still interested in the game, feel free to subscribe. In any case, thank you for watching, and see you next time.